Thank, thanks for being here for on a Friday, and you know this is we're calling this group the Closers, and we got handed pretty much the the million or should I say tr trillion dollar question of will plant based clean meat save the world? So good luck, guys. All right, so let me introduce this this amazing panel. Um, Isaac Emery, he's a senior environmental scientist at the Good Food Institute. He's been there for a year now. Pat Brown, which we all know is the father of this movement, the CEO, co-founder of Impossible Foods. Scott Faber, he's the vice president for government affairs at the Environmental Working Group and Sara Pack, registered dietitian. So we got the big question, and Pat, I gotta start with you because check out his shirt, Choose Earth. So, you know, we've discussed all, you know, investors, the money behind this, but what's the bottom line? What can this, your technology do to make our world a better place? Well, see, it's, it sounds like hyperbole, but literally, um, the reason that I founded this company was to save the world from what um, is right now uh, a, the biggest environmental catastrophe um, that has basically ever happened, which is the um, insanely destructive impact of our use of animals as a food technology. Um, and. Um, I forgot your question, but anyway. Yeah, Wait, let's, let's start this with is this. What it's, yeah. This is what it's all about. Yeah. yeah, so let's start with this. What's the problem, walk us through the key problems with the meat industry to, today and how it's in, impacting our environment. Isaac, you're, you're the, the, the pro on this. Walk us through, what, set the alarms off. All right, so, um, actually this would be, I could try to put up my, my, my one slide for this here. Um, I have basically spent the last year reviewing, what, trying to figure out what are the major harms that we're trying to solve here, and how bad are they really. Um, and the truth is that when we talk about sustainability in general, um, it's very it's used very widely. Um, but as a scientist, I like to think in terms of metrics. So what are some metrics that we can use to talk about sustainability and keeping civilization moving forward? So some other scientists have come up with a set of what they call planetary boundaries, which are things that happen on planet Earth that help keep Earth operating in the way that uh, it needs to keep operating for civilization to continue in the long term. And these include the presence of biodiversity, the presence of the stable climate, uh, continued as forests on the planet, uh, and a lot of other things. And what they've done is they've put together this sort of chart that I'm showing you a version of here. Things that are in green, we're, we're in the same zone right now. Things that are in yellow, we are um, potentially crossing some dangerous planetary boundaries and getting into a territory that is different than the conditions in which we have built a civilization on. And areas in red are areas where we are definitely beyond the comfortable conditions in which we have found civilization on Earth. And so if we go to the, there's a follow-up image to this. The areas that are shaded, that is the impact in these areas of animal agriculture. So there's a lot of attention right now on climate change, which is great. Climate change is a huge problem. Um, and animal agriculture does contribute to that problem to the tune of about 15 to 20% emissions. But you can see that in other areas, like biodiversity and in fertilizer use and deforestation, the bulk of the problems that are happening on planet Earth are due to animal agriculture and the way that we are trying to feed ourselves. And so by limiting those impacts and switching to more plant-based or more efficient methods of production, like clean meat, we can mitigate these huge problems. Yeah, out to you, Scott, because I know you have a slide too. What's really at stake? Yeah, so let me maybe put a, a little bit of a finer point on that. So as, as uh, Isaac said, uh, livestock accounts for 15 to 20% of greenhouse gas emissions now. I'll come back to the slide in a minute. Um, 
meat, the consumption of meat and dairy is going to increase 60 to 70 percent over the next 30 years. So what that means is that even if we do everything right with regards to how we power our homes and businesses and how we fuel our vehicles, all of the increased emissions associated with meat and dairy will wipe out those gains. So what that ultimately means is that unless we dramatically change the way we eat to eat less meat and dairy, or all of you somehow change the way we produce meat and dairy, uh, we're facing a climate catastrophe. So that means none of you can take the weekend off. You've got to get right back to work on this. This is, and that's, and to, I think that is the reason that th the, uh, the, the products that you're producing are so important. That I, I think it's, uh, as you heard from other experts, it's unreasonable to assume that we're going to dramatically change our diets or that as other people uh, become wealthier, that they're not going to want to enjoy the same diets that we enjoy. And so uh, ultimately it's up to all of you to change the way we produce meat and dairy so that we reduce rather than increase emissions as people eat more of these add more of these proteins to their diets. Um, but the, but that's, and that's a, that's a uh, compelling reason for all of you to work harder. The reason ordinary people might care about this, in addition to caring about the future of the planet, is that the way that we use fertilizer and manure has a dramatic impact on the quality of our drinking water. And uh, this map, which is on EWG's website, if you search for, through our tap water database or search EWG in trouble in farm country, shows that in many places across the heartland, the amount of nitrate that's in finished tap water, so finished tap water, the, the, the water that comes out of the tap when you turn it on, in many places, especially the, the red dots, uh, the, the amount of nitrate is above the legal limit. The pink dots shows the places where nitrate is above five parts per million or above the level that th our scientists tell us ex increase your cancer risk above the one in one million level. The purple dots show us places where total trihalomethanes or the breakdown products of chemicals that we add to our water to address the impacts of animal waste are above uh, health, health, health guidelines. So, um, if you live in these places, this is a really serious problem, and it's not a problem that's easily solved by technology, because by and large, these are small rural communities that can't afford to tax their ratepayers to upgrade their wastewater, their water treatment infrastructure to deal with this problem. So while while the the risk to the planet is enormous, and that should be incentive enough for us to be thinking hard about how to create uh, clear regulatory pathways for these alternatives. Um, the, the reason that ordinary people might care is that every term, time they go to the tap, millions of Americans are getting an unsafe amount of nitrate or an unsafe amount of total trihalomethanes in their drinking water. Yeah, thank you. All right, so we, we went through the environmental, but let's talk about public health. As you know, chronic diseases have skyrocketed over the last decade. How does this, how does the, the meat industry affect us from the, the health standpoint? Well, I think, um, you know, in America we consume about three times more um, protein than what is necessary. Um, and this is by no accident. I mean, it, it does have to do with a lot with marketing and also nutrition science being skewed by uh, being funded um, from certain entities that would like for you to consume more protein. So I think there's a lot um, culturally as well in Western countries um, to eat more protein is, for example, more manly. There's a lot of um, aspects of that, you know, in our culture that if you eat a salad, you know, you, it's, a, it's, a, it's a girl food or something like that. So there's a lot tied into why we think protein first. You know, when we're actually what's, what we're lacking is 5 to 10 per percent of our population um, has um, enough fiber in our day. Right, so it's actually it's do you ha where do you get your fiber, is more of something that we should be significantly concerned about if we're talking about health. Uh, but we think about protein as a healthy food, 
So this is a big issue to think about. How do we change this conversation? Because it is embedded in our culture, and we're exporting obesity and chronic disease um, internationally, right? Globalization means Americanization, really. So um, America has a lot of great things, and we have a lot of great tasting processed foods and meat products. So how do we shift that? Um, uh, I think we can do a lot of good. Um, I know that we're trying to talk about what's affecting our planet, and also what can we do to solve this issue together. And one of the things I was thinking about when I was thinking about this panel, and that whole, um, the big question of how do we save the world, um, I thought to myself, and maybe to the audience and the panelists as well, is what does saving the world mean? So I just wanted to take two seconds for all of you to think for you, what does saving the world look like? What does it look like for you? Anybody want to take that one? Pat? Well, I mean, oh. your technology, if you, if you could put a dream out there, how is this how will this save the world, and, and what, it, what area will it hit first? Well, I, I can go through a few ways in which, um, so our, our mission is to completely replace animals in the food system by 2035, and the, uh, which we will certainly do. And the, um, uh, some of the impacts will be, so right now, uh, um, the uh, land-based, uh, animal-derived meat industry occupies about 50% of the land area of Earth. It's either uh, being grazed or uh, growing feed crops, okay? Um, the, uh, and that's land that formerly um, provided essential ecosystem services, supported biodiversity and so forth. Now it is basically supporting an extremely monochromatic uh, kind of ecosystem, and in fact, um, I think it's maybe well known to this audience, I don't know, but a lot of people don't know that uh, um, the um, total biomass of just the cows right now that are being raised for food, if you put them all on a scale, outweighs um, every uh, remaining land vertebrate by more than a factor of 10. And um, so basically, if you and pigs being raised for food outweigh every uh, remaining wild uh, vertebrate on land by a factor of two. And um, so effectively right now what we've done is we've taken the entire surface of Earth and pretty much replaced the biodiversity with either uh, the animals that are being raised for food or the crops that we're using to feed them. Um, and of course, you know about the water and greenhouse gas impact. So let me just talk about, suppose you reverse that. What do you get out of it? Um, uh, for one thing, you can allow those ecosystems to recover and take basically uh, um, the many species that are threatened with extinction due to habitat destruction and degradation and give them a chance to recover and survive and provide the you know, ecosystem services that keep the entire biosphere functional, which which depends not just on uh, uh, trees, but all the species that, that make a, a, a healthy ecosystem. Secondly, the um, amount of biomass that, um, uh, the difference between the amount of biomass that formerly existed on the lands that are being used to raise animals for food um, and the amount that is currently uh, on that land, that 50% of Earth's land area, is equivalent to about 15 years worth of fossil fuel burning. Uh, at current rates. So um, if you could snap your fingers and make that industry go away, which I would do in a heartbeat if I could, um, uh, you would immediately actually start to do something that uh, uh, really doesn't even get discussed as a possibility, which is to reduce atmospheric CO2 concentrations, not just stabilize them, but if you did nothing but just step back, stop grazing, stop growing feed crops on that land, and just let the biomass recover, atmospheric CO2 concentrations would start going down, which would give us um, a, a hugely valuable opportunity to get our act together in terms of other sorts of uh, um, greenhouse gas emissions. I could go through a long list of yeah. ways, but let's just put it this way. 2035, mark it on your calendar. Things will be much better. Okay. Well, yeah. so <laughs> 
round of applause there. Great. So if you guys have any questions, we are taking questions on Slido. And I actually have one which is, I think is very interesting. Is there any studies that compare the sustainability of clean meat to that of plant-based meat? If so, what do they say? Does anybody? Well, so uh, Impossible Foods has done some LCAs that show that, um, that the carbon impacts, the carbon costs of beef in particular are significantly greater than plant-based foods. Um, and in, in the case of our, ours, we've done an LCA and it's uh, um, eightfold less. So one eighth of greenhouse gas emissions are the same thing from a cow and it'll, it'll get better from there. Yeah. 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 And, and a, a question for you, um, Isaac, that you know, we're losing um, soil at a rapid rate. Um, how do we, how, you know, if we move towards this more plant-based, how do we rebuild soil as quickly, you know, how can we rebuild it? Um, and if that's not your area of expertise, I just thought it was a good question. Oh, it's an excellent question, and it's an incredibly important um, topic. And I think it is um, it's crucial, but a little bit tangential to kind of the, the core um, benefits that plant-based and clean meat tend to offer. Um, I think it has, there's definitely a message in that problem for the clean meat and plant-based meat companies and in their suppliers, um, especially I think for clean meat that will rely a lot initially, I su I'm supposing, on the same kind of supply chain that um, for feeds for the cells that the animal industry is currently relying on. Some of the cheapest sources of amino acids and sugars that allow cells to grow are corn and soy, and that's why the animal agriculture system used them. So um, kind of trying to put pressure on the upstream supply chain of those mm -hmm. products to ensure sustainability at the farm level will be really important, but um, that's important no matter where we get uh, the feedstocks for our, for our agricultural system. Um, but if you don't mind uh, me going back to the LCA questions sure. that we've been having, um, there hasn't been specifically a comparison of plant-based and clean meat LCAs in part because both of these industries are in the midst of so much change and development uh, that you're essentially be comparing two systems that are in flux and that is extremely difficult and would suffer from accuracy problems. Um, I would say that we've done an LCA, mm -hmm. it's a snapshot. You know, Absolutely. But it was looking rigorously at you know, everything from what fertilizers went into growing our crops, what water went into growing the crops that wound up uh, um, being our feedstocks, and pretty much the entire system. And, um, and although it'll only get better, I think it's, it's, it's valuable information. And, and again, I think that it just, it just tells you something important about the trajectory. It's already, like I say, one-eighth the greenhouse gas emissions and a quarter of the water and less than one-twentieth the land footprint, which is extremely underappreciated as an environmental impact of the current system and, mm -hmm. and arguably uh, the most destructive. Um, but I think although the system is in flux, the trajectory is only in a good direction. And so you know it's already better and it's gonna just get more better. Now as for you know, clean meat, I think that there is right now no implementation of that technology that would allow you to do a life cycle analysis. So I'd say that will, the jury is out, but um, with respect to plant-based meat, I think there's no question that there's a huge, a huge I, benefit. Can I just add one quick thing, which is that it, and, and, it's, and there's good reason to be skeptical that the way we produce feed for traditional meat uh, won't significantly improve. And the reason is, is that uh, the challenges posed by how we produce feed for traditional meat, which is the primary environmental challenge ultimately in the production of meat, uh, are well known. We've been, we've been trying to address them for decades. There's a dead zone in the Gulf of Mexico that's the size of New Jersey. Lake Erie would turn green again this summer because of polluted runoff from farmland. And we've poured more than $40 billion into incentive programs that are designed to encourage the producers of feed grains to reduce that 
pollution that's ultimately creating the drinking water problem that I described as well as a host of other environmental challenges. And there's as much nitrate in the Mississippi River today as there was 20 years ago. Uh, so so there's, there's reason to be skeptical that whatever we're going to call traditional meat, um, that ultimately that the, the way we grow feed isn't going to significantly improve if we're worried about drinking water or climate change. Um, that doesn't mean we shouldn't try. Congress is writing a new farm bill. Lots of groups like EWG are trying to change how we spend the three billion dollars a year we give to farmers to reduce, uh, attack the problem of polluted runoff from farmland. But the evidence so far suggests that we're not going to make progress fast enough to address the kind of challenges that we're talking about. Yes, yeah, Scott, so, you know, talking about, you know, we've known about these challenges for years and you've worked a lot with the government. What's the problem with lawmakers? Why isn't this change being implemented? Yeah, so, uh, so first and foremost, I don't need to tell anyone in this room that uh, agriculture is, is, is basically exempt from our basic, our, our fundamental clean air and clean water laws, although there is some state regulation in some states. By and large, in the, the states that you saw where all the dots are, uh, the governments and the, the federal government and state governments don't have the power to ultimately restrict how fertilizer and manure is used to produce the, the feed crops that are fed to animals. And, and even though Congress does provide $3 billion a year to farmers to try to address these big environmental challenges, a lot of that money is siphoned off into projects that are more akin to business expenses like irrigation pipelines or even manure lagoons. And so, uh, there just hasn't been the willpower in Washington to ultimately face up to what is a really serious environmental crisis that affects the people who live in, in and around, especially in these rural communities. And again, I can't put a finer point on this, that these are the communities that have unsafe levels of nitrate or unsafe level of these breakdown product chemicals that are linked to various kinds of cancer, simply don't have the resources to invest in drinking water improvements necessary to meet the, the goals of the Safe Drinking Water Act. So, uh, so it's the, the people who are neighbors of these farmers who are ultimately paying the price for Congress's failure to set limits or make good use of your tax dollars and make sure that money is flowing to farmers who actually want to do the practices we know help address drinking water pollution, planting cover crops, changing tillage practices, putting streamside buffers, and frankly things that we've known about for centuries and that farmers have been doing centuries, but we're just not doing at a scale that's a, a sort of equal to the challenge. I, I, I disagree with you on one aspect of this, which I just feel like is uh, um, doing trying to make something that is in, as insanely destructive and inefficient as using animals in the food system uh, a little bit better is a complete waste of effort as far as I'm concerned. I just feel like, you know, okay, you get farmers to use slightly less insanely destructive practices um, uh, raising animals, you know, I, I, uh, yeah. I, I wouldn't waste any time even talking about that. The problem, then you'll get something that, you know, is, 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 you know, there's slightly less nitrates in the water and you still have an environmental catastrophe. So I just feel like um, that's, that's a distraction. That's a red herring. That's, uh, um, but don't you think, I do have a question though, because, uh, or to add to this conversation, and I'm really glad you brought out about the inequities, you know, and the farmed animal, um, world and this is why we really want to expedite the process of clean meat and plant-based meats to um, to ultimately replace meat by 2030 right Pat so um, so what I'm thinking is um, you know the uh, meat and dairy industry is about a 240 billion dollar industry so they have lobbyists right and a lot of us here know this so they have lobbying power and that's why Congress doesn't move on there's no will uh, because the money's, in, money's there. Also, the Farm Bill has um, a, a sector that funds the manure uh, cesspools. So it's already systematically ingrained in our system. It's institutionalized. So I do agree with you, Pat, that we have to figure out something fast to change the current system because we, frankly, I don't think we have that much time left because we were talking about Planet B <laughs> during our <laughs> break. We only have Planet A at the moment. 
Um, and so um, m my ponderings as a public health dietitian is, uh, I do work with you know, federal regulations and submit comments and so forth because I do think that there is a place for policy change because ultimately we do need to look for upstream intervention to stop this madness. Um, and it does take a longer time, but the previous panels were also speaking about policy. And I think we all need to work together to change the system. Um, and as upstream as possible, but also the disruption at the product level needs to happen as well like as what Pat was saying. So I just thought that was um, critical for both, you know, all of us to work together in this. Yeah, and I think one of the biggest issues with that is consumer. How do we change their mindsets? Because, you know, we all know with like the cigarette industry or processed foods, people are still going to buy it. How do we make the consumer care? How we do don't. We, we don't. First of all, it'd be great if we could make the consumer care, but, but um, that's not going to solve the problem. I'll give you a really good illustration of that. So when I was in Paris at the COP21 thing um, a couple of years ago, uh, and there you have you know, uh, a significant fraction of the world's most uh, knowledgeable and, and committed environmentalists. And first of all, every single thing they served uh, um, had meat and dairy in it, mm -hmm. and secondly, Everybody there who are great people, they know the problem, they care about it, went out and had meat for dinner. So the, the, the solution is not to educate people. I'm, I love education. I was in that business for you know, most of my life. But, um, but it's not going to solve the problem. It's not lack of education. It's, it's what, the only way to solve the problem is not ask people to change their behavior. Let them behave the way they want, but reduce the destructive impact of their behavior by producing these foods uh, in a way that doesn't have all the, uh, all the destruction. Give them meat, give them milk, give them fish, just make it directly from plants, and, uh, and they can think whatever the hell they want. Yeah, yeah but when they're at the... <laughs> but one of the issues is when they're at the grocery store, how do we get them to, because consumer demand drives, you know... Make it delicious, make it, here's the thing, the only way this will work is if we make foods that a consumer who is, who is not thinking about nitrate pollution uh, or, or you know, biodiversity, they're just looking for something delicious to eat that's affordable, that has, you know, and I agree with you, protein is ridiculously overrated, but, but has the nutrients that they think they need and, um, um, and, and just give it to them and make it our job to uh, find a way to, way to produce it that is um, sustainable. Yeah, and you guys, any other thoughts? Because, you know, Scott, you and I talked about this, this industry and the GMO industry, you know, they didn't educate people early on enough about the technology. Not that I'm comparing the both, but we need to educate people on what lab-grown meat is and how we're make, creating these plant-based burgers to taste like a burger. Because Mary in Texas, we're gonna have, she's gonna have to understand this to, to buy it at her local store. And we have to hit those markets that are not New York, San Francisco. We gotta, we gotta open this up to, to everybody. Well, well, Pat's right. You just, you just have to make it delicious and affordable and convenient and ultimately uh, don't force the consumer to get a PhD and <laughs> I know, we don't yeah. know. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I love I mean, PhDs as much as the next guy, but... Yeah. But, Although, yeah. to be that, fair, you know, I work, now that I'm at GFI, I got a PhD. That didn't help. For a long time, I was one of the environmentalists who didn't realize the impact that animal agriculture was having relative to these other things that we were doing. When I was working on biofuels, there was a trade-off that I was aware of, but didn't really see the, the, rel the com comparison with animal agriculture, where biofuels were promising to reduce the impacts of climate change with the cost of more land use. You had to grow crops to solve the problem. And when we've looked at you know, everything we've been talking about on stage for the last several minutes, and the, the big red segments of the circle that I was showing you earlier, those problems aren't problems of climate, they're problems of land use. And so as big an issue as that is, having this solution of more efficient food production that people will eat, not because um, it's what they've been told to eat, um, as we've been seeing for decades, being told to eat a whole foods plant-based diet, 
doesn't cause people necessarily to eat a whole foods plant-based diet. Um, but if people want to eat meat and we provide them meat that cuts land use by 30%, by 90%, uh, the impacts of, there have been some LCAs on clean meat people have been asking about. Um, they are old, they are out of date, but they do provide us with a range that lets us understand what the potential impacts of this new technology might be. And when we're talking about clean chicken, we're talking about improvements in land use of a third to two thirds. When we compare a clean, we look at clean beef, we're talking about land use reductions in the order of 95% to 98%. So these are really huge contributions to a solution of the climate problem, to the biodiversity problem, to the fertilizer problem, um, and having this sort of one-stop shop where someone, Mary in Texas, can go to the store and buy a steak or buy a burger and not even necessarily be aware that she's saving the planet. And I, I Jay, there was a, you, you raised a, uh, there was a, I think an embedded assumption in the question you're asking, which is that um, uh, somehow that there is uh, among people who love meat, current meat lovers, um, there is an, uh, an inherent uh, preference for their meat to come from the cadaver of an animal. Mm -hmm. And um, we at Impossible Foods and, uh, uh, have, have done a tremendous amount of research about this. And, and I wish I could do the poll of this audience, except that I, uh, there may not be enough meat eaters, but who, who, who loves meat here? Yeah, okay, actually, I love it, great, okay. And, and, um, and how many people here, um, uh, for how many people here is part of what you love about meat, part of the value proposition of meat, the fact that it's made the way it is from a, a cadaver? <laughs> I'm serious, that's a, that's, a, that's a legit question. If you ask that question, and you don't ask it as provocatively as I just did, but just ask it in a more uh, neutral way, um, uh, and we've done this around the country to hundreds of hundreds of people. Um, what we found is that it doesn't matter whether you're in Memphis or Texas or San Francisco or wherever, uh, meat lovers do not value the fact that meat is made from animals. They value the fact that it's delicious, it has a lot of protein and iron and stuff like that, that it's convenient, affordable, familiar. Um, in spite of the fact that we make it from animals. Yeah. And so, and we have, we have very good data on this. So there's not this inherent uh, psychological barrier to eating delicious meat that's made directly from plants. The barrier, I think, comes from the fact that uh, historically most of the foods that have been purported to be meat replacements um, are barely palatable, and people just expect that, uh, uh, that you know, they they have the notion, it's kind of like if you ask someone 200 years ago, you know, uh, um, here's, you know, here's a cart that uh, uh, doesn't have a horse associated with it. People would say, well, what the hell? I mean, uh, it doesn't make any sense at all. Until they actually see that it does a better job of delivering what they want uh, than what they had been using, and bang, it's, it's a no-brainer. Yeah, and I, no, go ahead. And please. I think Pat also in your survey, did you ask whether um, consumers of you know animal meat would eat it um, with no seasoning? Because people complain about tofu having no seasoning, uh, no taste, and it's bland. It's you know, I mean, flesh has no taste, so you have to season it. That's what you hear from Top Chef all the time, right? You didn't season the meat right. So I'm just wondering, you know, if they ate flesh with no seasoning, I don't think we know what that tastes like anymore because jerky and everything gets into some sort of a sauce or marinade, right? And the other thing that I'm also, um, you know, hearing your aspiration about replacing meat, you know, the developing country will consume about three times more meat than we, you know, the developed com countries will. And they have many, many more billions of people. So how do we bring this type of replacement products um, to that kind of scale so that it is in the hands of those who are going to essentially in the future from this point forward creating this meat crisis? Not on their fault or anything because we, we eat, you know, a portion wise, way more per capita than they do. But, mm -hmm. you know, I, I'm just wondering about, you know, how to replace the meat in those countries that might not have access to it. Well, I almost think, do we have to re-educate, especially Americans? I mean, I read that we're each eating over 200 pounds of meat 
Uh, I, I don't think education works. As a dietitian, I don't believe in education much because um, no one on this planet, you know, I mean, seriously, everyone knows fruits and veggies is good for you. Everyone, right? So then what do we do? How do we, how do you, now everyone it, wants to have, they're okay. protein obsessed. So Americans. it's, you know, okay, also like gene doesn't determine your health, right? It's about 20, 25%. 85, 80 to 75% is determined by all the other factors that contributes to your health. So it's the zip code that matters more than your gene code, really. You know, and California Endowment did a great job um, reflecting this. So we got to think about the environment, and I do think that we are a product of our environment. We learn from cues. We learn from cues, you know, around our um, homes, streets. If you have a, cor a corner store or a liquor store down the street, that becomes your norm. That's what you're going to eat. That's, wh that's who you're going to hang out with. And again, it's not by their fault, it is by design. So I think that we do need to think about those environmental changes um, in developing countries and developed countries to make a significant shift globally to save the planet. Yeah. I, I would say that I think it's as it, it's, it's true elsewhere in the world as, as the US that what the, the way you have to approach this problem is to accept the fact that people already have a good idea of what foods they're looking for. You could educate them to make better choices, but uh, what you need to do is understand what they want and deliver it to them. Deliver the meat they want or fish or whatever, um, and just take responsibility for uh, making it uh, in a much more sustainable way without asking them, because and without asking them to compromise on deliciousness as they define it, you know, what they're looking for nutritionally and so forth. If you, the minute you ask the consumers to say, hey, cut us a break, yeah, it's not that great, but, uh, you know, it's better for the planet, you know, you're just kidding yourself. Yeah, only the hardcore, <laughs> you know, consumers would do that. Yeah, go ahead. One thing to just, uh, so uh, in addition to uh, working at uh, EWG, I, I uh, helped run the Just Label It campaign, the National GMO Labeling Campaign, and before that I, uh, was the head of government affairs for the Grocery Manufacturers Association, the trade association for the packaged food industry. And I can't help but uh, uh, worry that this industry will repeat some of the same mistakes that the biotech industry made 30 years ago, um, especially with regards to this question of regulatory pathway. And, um, and I think Pat's right, you've got to make this choice simple. You've got to give the consumer what she wants. Mary wants meat that's delicious, convenient, affordable. Um, but the consumer also uh, is, uh, will switch loyalty if they think you're not playing it straight with them, or if they think that there isn't a regulator with enough uh, skin in the game or competency to ensure that the product's safe. And I think the danger is that in the, as you're thinking through how do we stand up this industry, you're making the right, you're obviously you should be and are thinking about which regulatory pathway poses the least hurdles for us, but you should also be thinking about which regulatory pathway will build the most confidence with your consumer, especially the initial consumer. And, um, and that was a, a, a mistake that the biotech industry made 30 years ago when they didn't play it straight with their consumer. So that's just something, so I think um, Pat's right in that you've gotta make this a simple choice for the consumer. There are many more consumers than ever before that are thinking about these questions of sustainability. I know because they're on our website using our uh, shopping tools every day by the thousands, but that's, uh, that doesn't change the fact that ultimately the cons mo you know, mom's gonna go to the marketplace looking for the food she wants, and um, at least most of them yet aren't using the EWG app as they're walking down the aisles. They might be in 2035 or maybe 2025 or maybe sooner, but, um, but I do worry that in the rush to find the regulatory pathway that produces, pose, puts the fewest obstacles in your way, you're gonna lose sight of the fact that um, consumers will have a lot of questions about this, these new products. And mm -hmm. if you're not playing it straight with them, you're, not, you're, you're pretending like these are the same things they've been eating for centuries, as the biotech industry did, um, they are gonna have a lot of questions. Well, first of all, I completely agree with what, what you're saying. I feel like it's absolutely part of the social contract with consumers 
to be completely transparent about uh, um, what they're eating, what's, what's in your product and so forth. And I can tell you my company has been as conscientious as we could possibly be about from before we even had a product on the market about communicating how we're producing all the ingredients and stuff like that. And I think it's not just a matter of a social contract, but as you were sort of uh, um, uh, you know, alluding to, um, if, you, if you betray that trust, the consumer, you're never going to get back, and it's just going to hurt you in terms of you know, achieving your mission. So um, that, I think, is, is absolutely without question true. An interesting aspect about this is that it, it does, uh, um, it would hurt us in the plant-based meat world to obscure the fact that our products are made from plants. Because again, we have a ton of data that to people who love meat, who are just like your daily, uh, you know, middle American meat lover, um, the fact that the meat that they're eating today is made from an animal isn't an asset, it's a liability. They would actually value meat more if it was uncompromisingly delicious, nutritious, affordable, convenient, and wasn't made from the cadaver of an animal. So, so we'd only be hurting ourselves if we tried to obscure that fact. And uh, um, we absolutely, you know, I, I think that's true for everybody who's in this business, is that it's an asset to say that, you know, you get all the deliciousness, everything you love about uh, meat, without the baggage of making it from an animal. Yeah, and that, that's why I brought it up, because I remember when I interviewed you for Fox, as our top story for a week straight, people are coming in with the questions, of, how does it affect my body? Is it different? Is, you know, are these, these animal cells that are making this, is it gonna, is it healthy for me? And that's, you know, where you come in is, you know, people are, want to know if, if there is a different impact. With the technology and um, the capital behind this movement, um, I'm hoping that we can, as, as we were discussing, to shape the plant-based protein space and the clean meat space to you know, modify some of the factors that affect chronic disease in the near future. I do think that the first step, though, is to replace that taste, convenience, and price so that the majority of the uh, meat eaters will c shift you know, towards a clean meat or a plant-based meat space with out the whole uh, cardboard, ca cardboardy taste and so forth, and they will never try it again. So I do think that we need to shift that um, perception of plant-based meat um, initially, so that they need to be delicious. Absolutely. Can I, can I just one yeah. other thing just to add is uh, just one uh, Washington lobbyist's opinion, um, <laughs> which is that I think this uh, the last we missed a lot of the last panel. But I did catch the part where uh, folks were asked, does it make a difference whether it's FDA or USDA regulated? And I think one, one factor just to think about is, do you want the, an agency of technologists who regulate some of the most innovative products in the marketplace um, regulating your products at FDA? Or do you want an agency that uh, tends to see the farmer as its client regulating your product? And, and I, I think that there are pluses and minuses uh, to both, but um, it's hard for me to imagine, I mean, I mean, as I can imagine certainly some of the benefits of being regulated by USDA, but it seems to me that having an agency that really seems to be uh, to always working with and supporting, nurturing innovators at FDA, um, working with your industry would ultimately be the wiser pathway. Having said that, I think relying on the current system that FDA has for reviewing food additives and especially um, has uh, poses a lot of uh, uh, reputational challenges. And um, I don't think there are any simple answers for how to deal with that. But um, there are, is lots of reasons for consumers to be skeptical about the way FDA um, reviews food additives and, and for good reason. And so I, I think simply getting the blessing of FDA under the current regulatory framework might not be enough to reassure some of the most skeptical consumers that you're going to try to sell to. I think, I think just with respect to the FDA, USDA thing, I think you really hit a very interesting point, which is that uh, who are they serving? The USDA, as you say, I think really sees its client as the farm industry, and the FDA sees its client as consumers and consumer health. So if you're a consumer, who do you want to be looking out for you? Uh, I think that you know, the answer is obvious. But, um, but you raise a question about the regulatory regime at the FDA. And I think that, that it's, it's constantly under challenge, and I, my feeling about the FDA is, uh, um, for, given the amount of resources that they get, 
And the number of things that they're asked to regulate that involve a very complicated set of, you know, uh, considerations to evaluate the safety, I think they actually do a phenomenal job. Um, but, but, but I think you can always get better. And the question is, um, how would you how would you suggest improving uh, that system that's yeah. that actually will work in the real world? Yeah, and so um, there have been a number of really um, and terrific ideas presented by groups like the Environmental Defense Fund and NRDC to modernize how we review food ingredients, food additives, and so on. Um, that wouldn't place enormous new regulatory hurdles in the way of, of innovators like your industry, but that would address what I think are some, uh, some credible criticisms of how the current process works. Uh, and so nobody wants to create a regulatory bottleneck at FDA. And for all the reasons I talked about at the top, um, this is an industry that environmental groups really want to see succeed, in part because we're not going to change the way people eat as much as we might want to. Um, and in part because if we do see this massive increase in the consumption of meat and dairy as FAO and others have predicted over the next 30 years, that's going to wipe out any gains we make um, with regards to greenhouse gases from stationary sources like factories or mobile sources like cars and trucks. So um, it's incredibly important that this industry gets to scale and I think a big part of that is having a regulatory regime that can work with you to address whatever concerns consumers may have about food that will sound new. Um, I don't think there's any way around that, and I, I don't think the current regulatory system provides that level of confidence for especially the consumer who's probably going to be most interested in what your your value proposition what, is. What should they do that they're not doing? Well, um, there's right now, as, as I'm sure the last panel talked a little bit about, and I missed, and nobody wants to go over the 58 Act again, okay. um, there's a giant loophole in the system that, by which uh, companies can bring food additives to the marketplace, the grass loophole. Um, so there are things that we can do to improve which products are allowed to use that loophole, if any, should at all. And so probably for another panel. Yeah. All right, final thought, because we are out of time, but how do we push this movement forward? Especially for the people who are watching, you know, on an individual basis. Like, how, what are your thoughts on getting this ball rolling to really get the impact that we want to see? What are your thoughts? Any thoughts on, you know? Yes. <laughs> um, I mean, there needs to, there is so much work that needs to be done. I mean, we've already seen this from on the technical side all day, the last two days. Um, you've heard from tons of people who are working on this and who, you know, they need more time, more work. There's a lot of innovation happening, um, but we're not at um, products yet that are going to convince Marion, Texas on all fronts for all clean meat, all plant-based meat products. So there's a lot of technical work that needs to be done. And on the environmental side, there needs to be a lot more collaboration, I think, between scientists in the environmental realm. Um, I think there's a lot we can do to convince people like me a year ago and five years ago who want to save the planet but who don't necessarily understand where the biggest actors and solutions are. And I think working together amongst um, you know, policy organizations and environmental organizations who work with the public to help keep them informed and keep them uh, engaged, both consumers and um, regulators, to keep everyone on the same page and aware of the potential for these products and the safety of these products as they get closer to market. Um, so I think there's a lot of opportunities to work together amongst environmental organizations, amongst professional scientists on the technical side and the environmental side, um, and of course amongst uh, the companies themselves too to keep uh, everyone in the loop. So that's sort of my pitch for inclusiveness. All right, Pat, how do we do it 2030? Um, well, I think, so when I got into this, for, for most of my life, I thought food was, was boring. I liked eating food, but I, I was just like, I would ne I've never taken a picture of uh, any food I've eaten in my entire life. And, and, uh, You're not um, on Instagram? No. And, <laughs> and, um, and then when I got into this, I thought, OK, this is really important for me to do because it's the most important problem to solve in the world. But what I realized was, Actually, and as a scientist, I'd been, you know, I was doing all kinds of stuff that I thought was, wow, this is such cool, interesting science, making discoveries, blah, blah, blah. And um, 
it would never have occurred to me that there was anything useful to be discovered in food. Then when I got into this, because I felt like I had to, to, to accomplish what I needed to do, I realized actually, wow, there's so many, the food as a system has been a complete wasteland in terms of innovation and fundamental research. I mean, people have done a lot of work on improving the genetics of crops and, and blah, 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 so I don't mean, the, relative to its importance, I mean, there's nothing more important to human survival, to the planet, to even quality of life than the food system. But as a topic for basic research, it's been like non-existent. And I realized like, uh, you know, seven or eight years ago that the most important scientific question in the world, it's not like, what makes a cancer cell behave the way it does, you know, understanding how to cure Alzheimer's or aging or something like that. It's what makes meat delicious. That is literally, it sounds like crazy, and it's, <laughs> but it's true. Because it's true. answering that question is how you solve the most important problem that the world faces. And I feel like it's a, it's a not, very non-trivial scientific question on many levels. Um, and uh, I would say for, if you were a basic scientist, a microbiologist like I was, and you're thinking about, okay, maybe I'm gonna study cancer and you know, maybe improve median survival of some cancer by 15 minutes or something like that. Um, uh, think about the possibility that actually there's a tremendous amount of good you could do for the world by figuring out how to make a food system that functions in the world of you know, going forward. I, you know, I'll just say I, I, I couldn't agree more. This is, uh, if, we, if, if you don't stand up this industry, uh, we're, the world is going to face a lot of hurt. So I, I think Pat and I disagree on one thing, which is that there are simple ways that we can dramatically improve the sustainability of traditional meat production. Um, we're we're going we're gonna to spend $3 billion this year. We're going to give farmers $3 billion this year through what are called working lands conservation programs. We could spend that money a lot better. There are opportunities right now as we write the, the farm bill for the next five years to do that. But in the long run, we've got to ultimately change the way we produce meat if we want to have the, a, a stable climate, clean air, clean water in addition to getting more sustainable performance out of traditional meat production. Great. Um, Pat, Alzheimer's and um, aging has been solved. It's called plant-based diet. <laughs> um, <laughs> but um, just to wrap it up, um, I do think that um, pushing the movement forward, um, you know, I've been reading and following Naomi Klein for a little bit. And uh, one thing that I did take and really resonated with me for this panel um, today was that she was mentioning about how we need to imagine and organize. So imagination and organization can launch a movement to create a transformational change, not just transactional. So I really would like to take that to my heart as I, move, I, as I do my work as a plant-based dietitian because I would like to see that world by 2030, that Pat is saying. And then um, transformation and the um, uh, meat production as well, because that's not going to go away immediately. So we do need to cre uh, create a change there. And, um, and the last thing I'll say is I think maybe Ari Nessel might be in the crowd, but um, I went to a conference and we were talking about we were meditating. And I think mindfulness or something around this is something that moves me when I'm in a really hard place to move a movement. And he said that we do need to move hearts. So not just minds, but mind and heart. So I just wanted to kind of leave that <laughs> on the it. table. Go uh, change hearts, guys. Yeah. All right, thank you so much. Thank you.